morning uh, Dr. Trahan. I'm Yanis Lonoki from uh, Hungary, Middle Eastern Europe, you know, and I'm um, the head of the department of the National Cardiovascular Center in Budapest of Hungary. So this is the first time for me here in India. I was impressed by the high quality standard of the healthcare system here that I uh, already seen. I'm Dr. Daresh Trihan. I'm the chairman and managing director of the Global Health Limited, which owns the Medanta Group of Hospitals. And I'm the chief cardiovascular surgeon here at Medanta Group Lab. What do you think about the future of the cardiac surgery, especially in India and global? So per se, the future of cardiac surgery in India is a huge demand and will keep growing for several reasons. One, we still have a lot of leftover of the rheumatic fever, which is now working through the valvular abnormalities are presenting themselves more and more. And we have a, a large burden of that. So we still have to fix a lot of valves. On the other hand, we have an aging population and they are producing their own challenges. Of course, aortic valves are, are getting degenerated, so are the mitral valves. So as this whole dynamics moves from the younger age group to the older age group, the demand for cardiac surgery will keep increasing. But what do you think about the robotics and, and endoscopic surgeries? Is there any advantage one over the other? Well, robotic surgery in its limited form is advantageous. Like in the mitral valve, and even in the aortic valve, of course it can be used and mitral is being used routinely, but also for mitral we have already uh, done the port access surgery so that it's minimal invasive anyway. But robotics can only enhance it, so it's a, it's a good thing. But the second thing is that uh, robotics in the coronary artery disease, of course it's uh, instead of having to manipulate the sternum so much, that we, it is very handy in taking down the mammaries and also then the minimal access surgery for, for CABG. So we are using that routinely here on a daily basis. Unfortunately, the anastomotic devices have still not really been perfected, nor the one that was, was so expensive that it's been abandoned in the world. So I think hand sewing of coronaries, robotically, yes, but we do 98% of our work we do on beating heart. So beating heart with the with hand suture may or may not be feasible for everybody, although we do it, but I don't think that it should be with the kind of disease that we find in India, which is very diffuse, heavily calcified vessels. I think you'll be compromising, but through minimal invasive, you can do instead of four, four, four portholes, you can do it through a two and a half inch incision on the left side of the chest or even right side when you want to do the right. So there are many, many approaches now available and robotics does have a role to play, no question. As we move forward, more and more technology will appear. In fact, we have an Indian robot now which is competing with the best in the world. So I think that there are there is a large movement going in that direction. Let's talk about something about uh, the use of biophotesis in the younger age group because you know, in uh, in Europe, actually there are many, many young people who don't want to have a lifetime anticoagulation. And the need is growing for bioprothesis, even in the age of 50 or something like that. So we're facing with this situation in, in a European being implant more and more biological aortic valve, also in the young age group. And I think also it's very important for this group to do the first surgery as minimally invasive as possible to be ready for the reoperation later. What is the situation about that in, in, in India? No. In India, we have actually used the cutoff point somewhere between 50 years to 55 years for a tissue valve. Mm -hmm. It is true that the convenience of a bioprosthetic valve is, is great in the sense that to have to remember to take medicines every day and control your INR and with the consequent uh, complication, yes, it, it is a preferred valve for sure. The point basically is what options are we offering the patients when they come to us in that age group and we explain the whole thing to them. And one of the other things that is happening today that if the tissue valve is going to last 15, 18, 20 years, then by that time the cost and the technology for doing catheter-based valve and valve is only going to come down, I hope. If a good sized valve can be put in the first time, then it always lends the option of valve and valve. 
Now, where are the suitable patients who are for percutaneous valve replacement in the aortic position especially? And uh, we are, the cutoff point we actually take is 70 and above and people who have any comorbidities and all that because in our hands and with the minimal invasive technique, uh, surgically, the mortality is 1%. There's a huge upside to doing a surgical replacement in a good size valve and which then can lend itself to, to further uh, manipulation by percutaneous methodology. Or you can even reoperate on them. But, but the basic thing is life is getting longer on an average in, the, in all the countries. So I think that India is also in the same track and now we have to start thinking in those terms. Now, the other way, place where we have used bioprosthetic off-label is in younger women who want to have children. So that's one, one part. Knowing very well the valves will fail at some point, 5, 10, 7, 7, 15 years, whenever it does, then they do have the option of valve in valve. So that's one part. Or we have to re-operate on them, yes, depending on their age, we may, we may replace it at that time with the mechanical valve. So these are all dynamics which we have to look at from the patient's point of view, from their socio-economic point of view, and their mental makeup to see which is a better valve for them. So I think all these principles we apply on, on, our, on our different age group patients and what their requirements are. The lifetime management of aortic valve disease. There are some, uh, some issues, some discussion about that whether Sauber first or Tower first or the valve or the Redo. Uh, what is the policy here? Um, do you prefer to do, first of all, the Sauber's or surgical aortic valve? And only the second option is the, for a patient younger than 70, it's only the second option is the Tower. Because there are some, some uh, voices from some cardiologists that uh, they propose to do Tower first and then reoperate you operate just as the first operation to open the chest and then expand the, the Tavi valve and then place a surgical valve. It is also one, uh, let's say, imagination of, uh, from the side of the cardiological field. Well, I, th I think this is the reverse that should be. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> because it doesn't make any sense. See, if you put a, a percutaneous tower and the valve fails in the first whatever year, number of years, then you're going to operate on them when they're older. And then what do you do? So after that, they will have, uh, they will have maybe a re-implantation. So from a cardiologist's point of view, suggesting that makes sense. But from our point of view, the younger the patient, the less the uh, indication for a tower, because obviously when they are 50 years old or 55 years old, their morbidity would be much less than when they are 70, 75 years old. So that's why I think that it's a reverse, in my opinion, uh, proposition that you do the tower first. Second is the point that is costly in countries like the US and Europe. The cost of surgery is more than that of a, ta a TAVI. In our country, it's the reverse. We are, the cost of, a, of a surgery today would be at least one fourth of the cost of a percutaneous valve. So economically also, it doesn't make sense to people. And when the need be, if they, if they need another valve, and because a lot of them will never need another valve. So the ones who may need it, the cost and the technology for tower is only improving every day. So we are hoping that that'll, that'll be a much better valve at that time and at much lesser cost. So I think that all the reasons that I just gave you make it a compelling argument that you should put the surgical procedure before a percutaneous, except when the patient's comorbidities are going to put them in a higher risk bracket Yes, of course, then tower is the right thing to do. Especially with minimal invasive approach being standardized now. A recovery period is actually five, seven days, 10 days, the patient is out running around. So there's not a big problem. Yeah, I think so. So yeah, a big sternotomy, maybe recovery time is longer. Yeah, and then maybe there is more of a reason to sort of indicate that maybe tower would be better, you can scare the patient. So I, 
Now there is no logic of that. Yeah. Whatever is good for the patient, we should do that because both techniques are, are now almost com comparable in the morbidity and mortality. Yeah. And if you do the cyber for an isolating aortic valve, what is your preferred approach for, you know, for a minimally invasive aortic valve replacement, whether it is a mini stenotomy or a mini thoracotomy or a... We use both. Uh, the, the reason being that it depends on the location of the aorta mm -hmm. and the degree of calcification. So if the, the aorta is placed more to the left than right, one indication that is mini sternotomy. Heavily calcified mini sternotomy and a very small aortic root which may, which may need enlargement mini sternotomy. Besides that, almost everybody can be done by uh, anterior thoracotomy, which is also very, heals very fast. So I think more or less the same. Um... I think also that uh, the future of cardiac surgery is to get uh, the young surgeons, you should motivate them to, to, to come to our field. And that's why I think, and we are also in, in, in the position that we're organizing many training for the young cardiac surgeons. We are concentrating on the education of the young cardiac surgeons, especially in the field of minimally amazing cardiac surgery, because it's really hard to adapt uh, from the very beginning. So we also start to to train our young surgeons already at the very beginning endoscopically, the very beginning using only small incisions. So I think it is the future for the young surgeons to be well educated, to be well trained by the uh, experts and we are concentrating and continues on the education and that I think helped us to, to make our profession a bit more attractive to the youngs. No question, I agree with you 100% that they need to be encouraged because if they don't see the entire perspective, they may get scared and say, oh, the future of cardiac surgery is not yeah. that bright. And they may choose something which is different. But if they are committed to being good surgeons, great surgeons, this is the freedom to be in. What would be your advice for uh, the young cardiac surgeons here in India? Well, I think the, the two things that need to be communicated that the demand for cardiac surgery is only going to increase. In the interest of the patients, there are always many, many uh, procedures which should be done surgically. So that is one part of it. The other part of it is that we should continue to innovate. We, the more we innovate, the more relevant we'll stay. So I think that that old uh, adage that, you know, the bigger the surgeon, the bigger the incision, is no longer applicable or true. You need to miniaturize because the patients, as long as you can keep them safe, the patient's preference naturally will be for the less invasive procedure. So I think that there are, there are many things that should not be done percutaneously, uh, especially in a country like India where we have very diffuse coronary artery disease. So partial revascularization is not a good thing. Uh, unnecessary stenting in diffuse disease, which can, which leads to either a edge stenosis or intrastent stenosis, uh, stenosis. All these things should be kept in mind in the interest of the patient. So I think if you look at it in that in that perspective and you're true to the your profession then cardiac surgery will grow, cardiology will grow because unfortunately the number of people who are going, who are suffering today and looks like will continue to suffer from heart disease is going to only increase. Yeah, so this more specialities cardiac surgery, cardiology should be supportive, not competitive. Absolutely, I think so. We are complementary, I think so. Thank you. Okay, sure. Yeah. So it's been a pleasure. It was a pleasure of mine, thank you. Okay, thanks.